Within the danger-laden realm of extreme sports, there is perhaps one sport that stands out as one of, if not the most extreme and dangerous sports of them all. A sport which has been a frequent topic across several videos on my channel. The sport of free solo rock climbing. For those of you that are not familiar with free solo rock climbing, allow me to briefly explain. Free solo rock climbing is the act of climbing large cliff faces that require the use of ropes to safely ascend. Without any ropes or safety equipment to protect the climber in the event of a fall. This means that free solo climbers must be absolutely sure with every move they make while they ascend, as even a simple mistake or minor slip up on the wall can lead to a fall that will almost certainly result in the climber's death. Because of the very high risk of injury or death involved with free solo rock climbing, this style of climbing only appeals to a small percentage of climbers that are both skilled enough to even fathom attempting such an ascent, but also only the least risk-averse thrill-seekers amongst this demographic of skilled climbers is drawn to free solo climbing. Free solo climbing's popularity began to pick up in the 1970s, a scene spearheaded by the immensely talented climber and subject of one of my previous videos, John Backer, who fearlessly pushed the limits of free solo climbing with several jaw-dropping climbs throughout the 70s, including his landmark ascent of the 511C rated route Butterballs in the Yosemite Valley in 1979. As free solo climbing continued to develop throughout the 1980s, John Backer would continue to push the envelope for what was humanly possible to ascend without ropes. However, by the 1980s and into the 1990s, another name would begin to become synonymous with the sport of free solo climbing, and arguably would ultimately become more instantly associated with the sport than even John Backer had become. The subject of this very video, the legendary climber, Dan Osman. Dan Osman was born on February 11, 1963, in Reno, Nevada. Dan took to the sport of rock climbing in his teenage years, frequenting a climbing spot at nearby Lake Tahoe known as Cave Rock, which was host to a number of difficult routes which Dan would hone his climbing skills on throughout his teenage years. Following his completion of high school, Dan would, like many young dedicated climbers throughout the decades, of course, find himself drawn to the stunning sheer cliffs and natural wonders of Yosemite National Park, where he would happily and easily assimilate within the so-called rock climbing bum community that has always thrived within the park. During his time spent at Yosemite, Dan would spend most of his time perfecting his rock climbing skills, working part-time gigs only when he absolutely needed some money to survive, and slept rough in the wilderness of the park, while also scavenging wasted food from the campgrounds for his sources of nutrition. Within the climbing community in Yosemite, Dan quickly earned a reputation as a dedicated, skilled, and daring climber, and by the late 1980s, he had also earned a reputation for several daring free solo climbs as well, and before long, Dan had attracted the attention of several sponsors to help fund his endeavors. However, despite securing a few sponsorships, the income and equipment they provided didn't quite make ends meet for Dan. And so, he returned to Reno to work construction part-time, while he continued his daring climbing exploits in his free time. In 1989, Dan established a new, difficult route on Cave Rock at Lake Tahoe, a 513-rated route that he named Phantom Lord. While establishing the route, Dan fell over 50 times while attempting to secure a bolt along the route, and it was during this process that he realized that he actually quite enjoyed the thrill 
of the falling itself, which would mark the beginning of one of his other greatest passions. In 1990, Dan would make his first appearance in the Masters of Stone series of videos, where he free solo climbed the 512C rated route Gun Club in West Virginia, showcasing his climbing talents to a much wider audience than he'd ever managed to garner before. He would follow this impressive climb up with free solo ascents of the 512B rated route Fire in the Hole at his longtime stomping ground, Cave Rock at Lake Tahoe, and a free solo ascent of Atlantis, a 511 plus rated route in the Needles of California. However, while he was most certainly gaining notoriety within the climbing community for these impressive free solo ascents, Dan began to drift away from rock climbing to pursue the thrill of his newly awakened passion, free falling instead. Dan began to experiment with free falls following his establishment of Phantom Lord in 1989, first beginning his experimentation with falls on par with a long fall during a rope descent, setting his gear up as he would if he were climbing. However, as he continued to experiment with these falls, he began to gain confidence in his ability to prepare for longer and longer falls. He began to craft complex anchor systems to withstand falls of even hundreds of feet, and by the mid-1990s, Yosemite's resident daredevils would find themselves drawn to Osmond's new sport of long free falls using climbing ropes with this activity typically being called controlled free-falling, or less flatteringly, body hurling. One former participant described the experience of one of these jumps as, quote, It wasn't like skydiving, where the ground is never really in perspective, or even like bungee, where you start decelerating long before you get to the bottom. On Dan's system, you got so close to the ground before the rope caught, it really scared me. The rush was just phenomenal, because there was no comfort margin like there is in base jumping. No margin for error, he recalled of the experience. In 1997, Dan would appear in Masters of Stone 4, where he would complete the most iconic free solo ascent of his career, an astonishing speed free solo ascent of the 400 foot 5.7 rated route Bears Reach, completing the climb, including the mid-route dyno, which truly left no room for error in just 4 minutes and 30 seconds. This iconic climb would catapult Dan into mainstream recognition, as the video of the climb would circulate largely via word of mouth in the years following its debut, and it reached such popularity that I even remember my dad showing me this video on YouTube way back in the day, and I don't think he's ever done any rock climbing in his life. With this newfound recognition, Dan found himself finally able to make a living off of his sponsorships while performing the adrenaline-pumping stunts he enjoyed so much. In October of 1998, Dan began preparations for an ambitious, adrenaline-drenched stunt in Yosemite as he, with the help of some fellow daredevils, rigged a 1,200-foot section of climbing rope as a tightrope between leaning tower rocks and an outcropping known as the Fifi Buttress. He planned to fasten a jump rope so he would fall away from the rocks. Over the course of a week, Dan would complete jumps of increasing lengths from the rope, starting with a section of rope 750 feet long and working his way up to a 900 foot long rope by the time he had completed his test jumps and all had gone according to plan while he did so. However, on October 26th, he received a phone call from his daughter who begged him to return home to Reno from Yosemite and so, Dan returned to Reno for the next two days. 
Upon returning to Yosemite on October 28th, he was arrested for a series of unpaid tickets and fines, as Dan was a bit notorious for his disorganization and had forgotten to take care of these issues. Dan would return to Yosemite as a free man about a month later, where he planned to dismantle his jump tower from the month previous, of course, after he made a few more jumps. On November 23rd, 1998, after Dan and a few of his friends made several shorter jumps to ensure that the ropes that had been left exposed to the elements over the course of the last month or so were still in good shape, Dan decided that before he took down the setup, he would attempt his longest controlled freefall yet, a thousand feet, and as practice, he rigged a section of rope to allow himself a freefall of 925 feet. This practice jump went off without a hitch, and Dan was confident he could complete a record freefall of a thousand feet the following day. On November 24th, 1998, Dan and a friend returned to the jump site and rigged up a thousand foot section of rope for Dan to use for his record setting free fall. Due to the great length of the rope, Dan would attempt this jump at a slightly different angle than he had before. After double checking that he was all set for the jump, his friend began recording. Dan leapt from the top of Leaning Tower's rocks and into the depths of the valleys below. Unfortunately, as the force of Dan's falling body weight caused one of the rope's knots to catch on itself, the great force exerted on the ropes caused his rope to melt from the immense friction, causing it to snap, sending Dan Osman falling to his death below. In wake of his death, there have been several in-depth investigations into what exactly must have happened to cause the failure of his rope, as well as into the potential factor of the rope suffering weather damage, and there are a large number of different theories on the roles each played in the accident. Dan Osman was a legend in the sport of rock climbing and a pioneer of free solo rock climbing captivating even mainstream audiences with his death-defying climbs, and his legacy within the sport will surely live on for many years to come. Thank you all for watching.